Alright. Uh, in uh, Norse mythology, uh, the trickster god Loki once made a bet uh, with his boss on the condition that should he lose the bet, they would come and cut off his head. Sure enough, he lost the bet and uh, the boss came. And uh, Loki argued that though they had every right to take his head, they uh, were not allowed to touch any part of his neck. Um, so, you know, the two parties discussed the matter and um, uh, tried to decide which body parts belong to the neck, which uh, parts belong to the head. And as it happens, they never saw the doubt, and uh, you know, according to legends, they are probably still discussing it uh, until the end of the day. Uh, in argumentation theory, um, Loki's wager is known as the uh, unreasonable or um, stubborn insistence that the concept should be uh, clearly defined, clearly uh, delineated, um, and uh, before you can make any meaningful uh, statement about it. So on to the demarcation problem. You probably know uh, what I'm getting at or where, where this is going. Uh, we have you know, seen that there, uh, there has been a backlash against uh, the demarcation problem. Nowadays it's, it's widely accepted that there's uh, no such thing as a silver bullet to uh, separate uh, science uh, from, from pseudoscience. It's now a, a commonplace among philosophers, at least those who are still uh, uh, you know, enthusiastic about the demarcation project, to, uh, to admit that there, there is no crisp and clear distinction between science on the one hand and non-science on the other hand, but that we have a continuum. All sorts of cliches uh, in between. Uh, now, other philosophers would, um, would uh, insist that uh, unless you have such a crisp distinction, uh, where you can uh, um, decide in, in all cases where a certain theory, a certain discipline uh, belongs, uh, you cannot have any meaningful discussion uh, about terms of science and pseudo science. Uh, Larry Law, for example, he um, argued that uh, the very term pseudo science. Uh, suggests a very naive and misguided uh, conception of science and uh, should be erased from our vocabulary uh, altogether. Um, so, the question I'm going to uh, ask or try to answer in this talk is are those who still insist along uh, those lines that the demarcation problem is uh, uh, untractable, are they committing uh, uh, the fallacy of, um, of Loki's wager, are they trying to distinguish the head and the neck? Um, the short answer will be yes. Slightly long answer is well, it depends. Um, there is actually in, in, um, one of the one of the major confusions I think with regard to the demarcation problem is that it has traditionally been uh, the banner of two related, though so, uh, distinct, uh, distinct problems. And I actually think that this connects well with uh, Spence's talk uh, about um, uh, the, the, the fact that not everything that falls uh, outside. The uh, category confines of science should be uh, dismissed as pseudoscience, uh, things that are uh, non scientific but not pseudoscientific. And if you go back, you go back very quickly to uh, one of the, you know, uh, the formulations of the problem that um, uh, instigated the modern version of uh, demarcation. Um, in uh, in, in Popper's uh, Logic of Scientific Discovery, which was published in, in German in 1934 uh, already. You, you uh, see that he's mainly interested in uh, the distinction between empirical sciences on, on one hand and uh, such disciplines or such endeavors as metaphysics and mathematics and logic and on the other hand. And it's notable that um, although Popper thinks that metaphysics, for example, is not scientific, he does not see that as a reason to dismiss metaphysics out of hand. On the contrary, he was actually arguing against the logical positivist who equated um, metaphysics with um, meaning as well. So Popper thought that we have to acknowledge that, that physics is non scientific, but it does not mean that it's completely uh, worthless. So, in a way, his, his distinction um, was um, relatively neutral. It was not, it had not the, the, uh, the knowledge that the dynamics that would take uh, later on, especially in the way that his criterion of falsifiability was, uh, was used as a, uh, you know, as a weapon against pseudoscience. As and indeed, you see in conjectures and reputations, um, 
Uh, Popper starts out with um, his, his, his fascination with um, a couple of theories that were involved there that were making headlines. On the one hand, Einstein's uh, theory of uh, uh, special relativity, and on the other hand, <coughs> uh, the theory of uh, uh, Freudian psychoanalysis and certain Marxist theories. So uh, Popper started out with the idea that there was something suspicious about Freudian theory, something uh, you know, uh, something fishy, and he wanted to sort, sort out he wanted to pinpoint what exactly uh, was uh, was the underlying problem. Then he came up with um, uh, this criterion of uh, falsifiability, uh, which he used to dismiss those theories, not not as, as uh, valuable, so not scientific, but really as pseudoscience, as it were. Uh, the, the term uh, pseudoscience uh, pops up. So um, I think that we should distinguish between those. Two different strands um, that are uh, often uh, inflated or that are, uh, uh, you know, brought together under the umbrella term of the de demarcation project. So on the one hand, you have a, a normative demarcation uh, issue, which is one with real teeth, uh, the one that distinguishes genuine uh, bona fide science uh, and pseudoscience, and then you have uh, uh, the territorial uh, demarcation problem. Uh, the normative demarcation problem um, is, is, well, I call it normative because the term pseudoscience is intrinsically derogatory. There's nobody who, you know, who uh, wants to, uh, uh, to have a PhD in pseudoscience as in a uh, muscle cartoon or who is proud of being a pseudoscience is something that people use to, uh, to, brand, to uh, brand each other, you know, to, to dismiss each other's research or each other's theories. The, uh, the territorial demarcation uh, Project, uh, by contrast, is more concerned with disciplining boundaries between philosophy, for example, metaphysics, or even everyday reasoning, and it does not involve epistemic warrant per se. So, uh, the decision where certain theory, certain claim belongs, on which side of the line it falls, does not immediately have a bearing on its uh, reliability, as I would say, on its epistemic warrant. I think that uh, the demarcation, the non demarcation issue, is the only one that is worth pursuing, and luckily it's also the only one that has to be tractable and solvable. Um, though I admit that um, there is no crisp and clear dividing line, um, uh, and uh, neither in the, dem uh, the normative uh, demarcation um, line and, and nor, uh, nor in the territorial demarcation line, but there are additional categorization problems in the territorial demarcation uh, problem that make it uh, less interesting to, uh, to pursue. Uh, I think that those territorial uh, boundaries between science, metaphysics, science and philosophy, science and humanities, for example, are largely pragmatic. And sometimes they are just an artifact of the language we have to speak. As Sven said, in German we have a more passing, more inclusive word, uh, uh, Wissenschaft, which is, um, uh, has, has a slightly different meaning than science in English. So I think that it has um, little epistemic import. I don't think that it's completely uninteresting. There are definitely interesting methodological differences. For example, uh, as Carol said, between uh, uh, historical sciences and uh, field sciences, uh, but I don't think that they um, they are relevant when we think about epistemic warrants, the reliability of claims, and I think that it's much more difficult to uh, to pull them apart uh, than it is in, in, in the moment of demarcation uh, uh, problem. So um, I'm going to give two examples of. Um, Philosophers who have, <coughs> as I see it, inflated the two pro uh, projects and have spread it uh, or have caused a lot of confusion uh, by doing so. Uh, Larry Long, who will be my first case, and I will move on to uh, the issue of methodological nationalism, and uh, Robert Pannock, who will be the uh, well, main target there. Uh, um, very quickly, first, why I think that the, the, the territorial problem is, uh, uh, is uninteresting. Uh, uh, firstly, I think. Let's talk about the distinction between science and philosophy. I think that it's very difficult to disentangle uh, philosophical elements from science. Uh, the idea that you can, you can conduct scientific investigation without any kind of philosophical background, without any kind of uh, philosophical perspective, is, is misguided. It's an illusion, I think. There's always some sort of um, whatever you want to call it, philosophy involved. And on the other hand, the other side of the coin is that pure a priori philosophy is. Uh, well, I wouldn't say that it doesn't exist, it certainly does, but I think it's mostly sterile from, uh, uh, from a nationalist perspective. I think that good philosophy uh, always has to take into account uh, the, um, the best 
not an uh, up-to-date scientific knowledge that is uh, available. Uh, so what we see, if we compare science and philosophy, uh, is that not only are they continuous, which is what science and pseudoscience are, but they're also interdependent. Science relies on philosophy and vice versa. You don't see that in uh, with science versus pseudoscience. It can be continuing all right, but astrologers, uh, I mean, astronomers are not waiting for the latest results in astrology to, uh, you know, to, uh, to pursue their, their research, to see that there's a, there, those are two independent fields and there's not, not a lot of interaction uh, in between uh, each other. Uh, okay, um, on to Larry Lovell in his um, paper on the demise of the demarcation problem. I think he completes uh, the two strands, the two different versions of the demarcation problem. Uh, and he discusses, what, and if you analyze the text, you see that he discusses um, problems with either of those versions and he uh, treats them as equally damaging to the demarcation problem in general, the generic problem. And he, um, so he treats the two, problems, uh, the two projects uh, in a way as interchangeable. Um, and you can see uh, how he does that if you consider two. Uh, traditional solutions that have been proposed to the demarcation problem. Um, first he discusses uh, falsification, isn't it? and his, his main beef with falsification is that it calls uh, scientific uh, status to, well, uh, not to find a point of plain bullshit, such things as uh, the idea that the Earth is uh, 6 hours years old, almost created in 6 days. Uh, so his, his uh, objection there is that those claims are strictly speaking scientific, according to Popper's criteria, because they are falsifiable, though, uh, though of course, rarely refuted. Uh, he calls falsifications for that reason a toothless wonder because it has no normative force. Uh, I think that problem can be uh, dealt with, um, not even within the public framework, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but what you see when he moves on to the next proposed solution, well tested this, he has a different objection. Um, the problem with well testedness, according to Baum, is that it fails to exclude patently uh, non scientific knowledge, such as chess strategies, historical claims, military status, etc. Those are the examples that we give. Um, he thinks that this is a problem because those are obviously, obviously uh, not treated as scientific. So I don't know how he can make that distinction if he doesn't believe in demarcation, but let's just, let's just give that. Um, but the problem is, um, if you relate the two objections, on the last slide, on the previous slide to each other, uh, I don't think they're compatible. I don't think that the two requirements can be fulfilled at the same time. Because if you come up with a demarcation line that succeeds in excluding those well tested knowledge claims from the category of science, military strategies, uh, you know, uh, chess strategies, etc., then you end up with a two plus one again. Because, of course, then the problem loses all uh, its, its normal force again. So, um, there's another cake there that Bob wants to have and, and, and eat too. There was, there was one in the first half, but it was a different one. He's going to have very fat. Yeah, he's going to be great. Well, it depends on what he does with it. Um, so you see that the, the two, so the normative and the territorial problem, were in tension with each other and cannot be fulfilled uh, at the same time. Um, another uh, uh, illustration of the confusion deriving from. Uh, conflating the two different strands within the demarcation problem is um, the concept of methodological natural. Uh, most of you would probably be familiar with, it, uh, with the basic idea. Um, it, it's a philosophical uh, principle uh, that uh, according to which science is by definition restricted to uh, the natural domain. It can only uh, investigate natural phenomena and it can only uh, come up with natural explanations for those phenomena. It has no appeal, it can make no appeal whatsoever to the supernatural. And also, this is important, uh, because of that, uh, it has no authority whatsoever to pronounce, to make pronouncements in the supernatural domain. So just it falls outside of its proper, uh, proper domain. Uh, this has been used by philosophers such as uh, uh, Robert Banks, but also by uh, a number of scientists uh, to, to counter uh, pseudoscience, in particular, uh, intelligent design and creation. Uh, and also to reconcile science and religion. You see that the, the, the promise it holds for uh, reconciling science and religion uh, is obvious because if you car carve out a special niche for supernatural, uh, the supernatural domain that science cannot touch, then you, know, you, uh, you, you, uh, you have a way to, uh, to pull the two domains apart and uh, to reconcile them uh, 
by doing so. Um, I think that this is confusing, this whole idea of methodological naturalism is confusing blend of uh, normative and territorial elements. Um, on the one hand, it's used to reject pseudoscience and has clearly has clearly a, a normative force. Um, if you, you can see it if you, if you, uh, um, uh, if, if you um, see in, in under what circumstances it has been applied. But on the other hand, uh, it has also a, a clear uh, territorial dimension. Robert Bennett, for example, uh, is, uh, is, is careful enough to point out that uh, science, uh, according to him, uh, or according to the principle of methodological naturalism, is scrupulously neutral about the supernatural. So there is a domain, the supernatural, well, may well exist, we don't know. Uh, at least as scientists, we, we, we can have no say uh, on the matter. Uh, it, it is the, the, the proper domain of, well, philosophers, metaphysicians. Uh, theologians, etc. Uh, there are a number of problems with this uh, idea of methodological nationalism. Uh, I'm, I'm going to um, briefly uh, you know, uh, list some of them. Um, it's not immediately clear to me why a supernatural miracle claim, you know, from the kind that uh, religious believers uh, put forward, why that would be um, intrinsically unscientific if, um, if, a, if, if a supernatural invention in, in the natural world in the material world has empirically detectable, uh, detectable consequences, I don't see any reason why we would not be able to uh, investigate that with scientific means. Evan Bales has written about this uh, in our volume. I also think that inadvertently, this principle of methodological naturalism does a disservice to philosophy because it suggests that uh, only those theories to which we attach the label science can have epistemic authority. You know, it's only science matters and science has, has, has no bearing on metaphysical issues or on uh, discussions about the supernatural. That is, you know, something between the spare time and as a philosopher, it's more a matter of a personal opinion, but it's moving harmless. It's, it's, you, you cannot decide by scientific scientific means. The whole idea of reconciling science and religion uh, is uh, dependent on this, uh, this idea. Uh, thirdly, I think that the, the concept of the supernatural um, is so elusive that it will define that uh, I think it's it's a bad idea to to uh, erect any kind of um, philosophical argument on its shoulders. So it's it's um, it's it's still advised to use them in an attempt to solve uh, the demarcation problem. Um, you can give a ballpark definition of the supernatural just to capture what religious beliefs are getting at, but I don't think that you can you know that it's of much philosophical use precisely because it's so uh, vague. Um, so in general. Um, I would say that the whole concept of the supernatural as part of a, a, a solution to the demarcation problem is a red herring because it bypasses um, underlying epistemic problems um, with, for example, the thousand design creation, which are not directly related to that label that we just we, we stick to the theory, the fact that it's, it is uh, supernatural. Um, I have no time to go into this, but I would, in general, I would say that. Um, the, the problem with this explanation is that they're empty. Uh, they, um, they explain everything and nothing. Uh, they're completely ad hoc. They don't uh, uh, offer any kind of uh, experimental reward. Uh, they, they are um, uh, completely um, uh, without uh, scientific merit, but not so much because they're supernatural. Uh, I don't think that the kind of problems that um, Dalton Design suffers from are intrinsic to uh, supernatural explanations, and I also also don't think that they're exclusive uh, to supernaturalism. You can have the same kind of uh, issues um, with it, in, in a perfectly natural context, for example. Conspiracy theories or Scientology, you see that we have the same problems with that happens with empty explanations um, or um, <coughs> um, are relevant there, even when the concept of the supernatural is not involved. Um, another reason, I think, for downplaying uh, the, north, the, the territorial uh, problem and paying more attention to the phenomenon of the demarcation job is that there is um, um, a similar or an, an equivalent normative demarcation uh, problem within uh, what you, you can call philosophy or metaphysics um, or the humanities if you want to make finding great distinctions. Um, as, as Sven said, there's, uh, it would be very misleading to invent a new term for uh, uh, Holocaust denial, for example. Uh, because, uh, you know, if you want to call it pseudo-humanities, that, um, um, that uh, 
obscures the underlying epistemic problems, which are actually very similar to, to, well, uh, to, to traditional pseudosciences like uh, astrology. Um, conspiracy theories, for example, are, well, you can call them attempts at scientific knowledge, you, you can call them whatever you like, but, but I think uh, the underlying epistemic problems are largely similar. Um, uh, David, uh, uh, I don't know which called them uh, Pluto histories, um, such as uh, the idea that 9 11 was an inside job for them, uh, the, the, uh, the Holocaust and the habits, etc. Um, you'll see that um, if, if you get down to the, the epistemic issues, that you have uh, similar distinctions, so that Holocaust denialism and that was design creation and astrology, for example, have more in common with each other than they have with their respective scientific counterparts, astronomy. World War II history and, and missionary theory. Um, I would even say that we have a, um, a, a similar distinction in philosophy. Um, very briefly, um, in, in, in some um, branches of uh, postmodern philosophy, um, one of the issues that is often raised is the conceptual ambiguities and equivocation, uh, which make the whole theory of the a moving target. Um, I think it's fair to, to talk in terms of pseudo-philosophy, um, but I think it's important to, to, uh, to note that exactly the, the problems of conceptual ambiguity uh, all, all, uh, also surface in, uh, in pseudoscience, and, and I think that they have the same protective rationality to make it theory into a moving target, they make it very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to criticize. So I think that there are similar epistemic problems in all those domains, uh, and that is the reason, again, for um, highlighting the importance of the Normative demarcation um, problem. So, although you can think of science and pseudoscience as two ends of the spectrum, um, I completely agree with that there are a lot of uh, borderline cases, but there are also a lot of clear cut cases. Both, most of the things that I mentioned, like astrology, uh, homeopathy, um, intelligent design creation, are clearly on, on the pseudoscience end of the board. Um, so, although we have to keep in mind that there is a continuum, I think it's also useful to, uh, to think about demarcations in terms of the, of the, of the lower diagram. So you have science and philosophy, for example, on the left hand uh, side, on the left side of the normative uh, uh, dividing line, which are mutually uh, uh, interdependent, uh, which rely on each other and form a continuum. And then on the other hand, you have two science and two uh, philosophy, which are completely different uh, creature altogether. So, Including slides, um, I think we should distinguish between the normative and the territorial problem. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, we should uh, devote more attention to the normative uh, demarcation problem, although we should keep in mind there's no single rule approach, there's no small set of necessary and sufficient conditions that will do the job. Um, we should keep in mind that pseudoscience uh, is um, a heterogeneous uh, category, um, but just as, also, as some sort of appetite, I think one of the the keys to solve to, to cracking the normative demarcation problem is uh, the fact, as, as Ben already mentioned, that pseudoscience, this is on the account of the term, is trying to imitate, is trying to, um, um, uh, is, is trying to do what science does, but, 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 in a, uh, but fails to do so. Right? so um, and I think if you approach the, the issue in those terms, that there are certain uh, diagnostic criteria that we can use. Um, to tell when the doctrine, for example, is falsely, uh, uh, falsely presented as science, has false uh, scientific uh, uh, pretensions. Uh, so uh, this and, 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 and similar issues are explored in the book once more, um, 